Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In this episode, we're gonna talk about annuities and specifically whether once you reach retirement or perhaps if you're already in retirement, whether you should take some of your investment portfolio and what they call annuitize it, which is just a fancy way of saying, take some money you've got saved and buy an annuity. Now, uh, this is a question I've received a lot from folks, which is why I'm addressing it. And we're talking about a very specific kind of annuity. They sometimes refer to it as an income annuity or a SPIA. That's a single premium immediate annuity. It's a very simple financial product. A lot of annuities are very complex. I wouldn't recommend many of them to my worst enemies. But a SPIA is pretty uh, plain vanilla type of annuity. You take some money, you buy the annuity, and in, in return, you get a monthly guaranteed uh, amount of money uh, for your life. That's sort of the basic single premium immediate annuity. So here's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna walk through a lot of tools, calculators, even a formula, and a lot of articles. So my goal today is to arm you with a bunch of information so that you can make an informed decision uh, for you and your family. I'm not here to either try to promote or sell annuities, that's certainly not what I'm doing, uh, but I'm not here just to rag on them either. I think uh, an income annuity in retirement can be a useful financial tool in some circumstances. And so my goal is just to give you a bunch of information so that you can make an informed decision for yourself. So with that, I want to get started. I'm going to walk through to begin with an example of an annuity, how much uh, you might get uh, in a monthly premium for say uh, a $100,000 annuity. So let's do that now. Again, I'm gonna have links to everything below the video, but what you're looking at here, this is Schwab and they have an income annuity estimator and you can uh, fill in the details. You can see what I've done is we're gonna look at an annuity from my lifetime. Uh, if you're married and you want the annuity to last for both you and your spouse, you could pick this one, but we're gonna stick with just uh, a single person's uh, lifetime annuity. We're going to uh, invest $100,000. Uh, the income, uh, the start date will actually make for today, which is, I'm recording this video on October 6, 2021. And um, for the birth date, and this is obviously very important because insurance companies calculate your, you know, how long they expect you to live, your life expectancy. Of course, that doesn't mean that's how you're, long you're going to live but that's how insurance companies price annuities. And so I'm assuming that someone, if I've done my math right, someone is 65 years old. In this case, we'll, we'll pick male is the gender. Again, that's important because females tend to live a little bit longer and you have to include your state of residence. We've just picked Alabama for this example. And uh, we, run the, we run the numbers and we'll see, and I don't know how well you can see that on the video, but in exchange for $100,000, again, assuming you're 65, uh, you're a man, uh, live in Alabama, uh, $487 a month. Now, let me quickly point out there are a couple of other options here, and you'll see these commonly. Let me try to make it even a little bit bigger for you. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, you can, one of the downsides to an annuity uh, is that, you know, if you buy it today and then a month from now or a year from now you die, uh, the contract's over. You don't get any money back. Your children uh, or other heirs, they don't receive anything. If perhaps you wanted to leave some money to charities, they wouldn't get any of it. The insurance company keeps the money. And so uh, recognizing that some folks are uncomfortable with that, insurance companies have offered different uh, sort of add-ons, if you will. And one of them is what's called a 10-year certain. So the idea is you're guaranteed to get at least 10 years worth of benefit even if you were to die within that 10 year period, of course, nothing's for free in this life. In this case, that 10 year certain only costs you $4 a month. Your monthly income goes from 487 down to 483. Not, I think not a particularly bad deal. If you go to 20 year certain though, the number drops, I think pretty significantly from 483 down to 442. And then a, a final option is uh, basically a deal where you're guaranteed to get back your 100 grand. And if you take that option, uh, your numbers drops a little bit more to 439. I point these out just so you are aware that these sort of options exist. For our purposes today, we're gonna keep things simple and we're gonna continue by looking at this single life only 487 a month. Now let's put this 487 uh, number into some perspective and to do that, 
I'm going to pull up my trusty calculator here uh, on my phone and we can take 487, multiply it by 12, that gets us an annual benefit of $5,844 and we can quickly calculate the math on a $100,000 investment. That means we're getting 5.8%. That's sort of, you know, the, the, the amount we're getting back each year, 5.8% percent of our investment and if you've followed this channel uh, for any length of time you're familiar with the four percent rule which is generally regarded as the most you can take out of a portfolio adjust that for inflation over time with the goal of not running out of money in say a 30-year retirement but with this annuity we're actually getting 5.8 percent and at first that might seem like a much much better deal why not take our entire portfolio say a million dollars for example and um, buy an annuity because we'll get 5.8% back. Well, there are at least two problems with that approach and they're important to understand. The first is uh, annuities are not indexed for inflation. That amount you're gonna get, $487 in this case, is what you're gonna get forever until you die. It does not get adjusted for inflation. And that's significant. Now, there was a time when you could buy an inflation adjusted annuity. They don't really exist anymore that I'm aware of. And part of the reason is insurance companies recognize just how corrosive inflation can be uh, to our finances over time. And insurance companies have very good memories. They remember the 70s and early 80s, as do I, when inflation was, you know, double digits and what that can cost an insurance company if, you know, we were to go back to that kind of inflationary uh, period and so they've stopped offering them now that's not necessarily a bad thing for us why because when they did offer inflation adjusted income annuities they were a ripoff frankly they were incredibly expensive and to give you just a taste of how expensive they are I want to show you another uh, calculator this one comes from Fidelity and again I'll leave links to this below the video I put in the same assumptions here and you can see the payouts are identical for all the different uh, types of uh, annuities or they're, they're nearly identical that some of them are off a, a dollar or two but one of the things this calculator allows you to do is to get a two percent annual increase so in other words whatever you pick here let's take our life only income annuity 487 dollars a month for life if we were to check this box that would allow us to get a, an increase every year of 2%. Now, that's not an inflationary increase. It's not based on the CPI. Inflation could be 8% a year. And if we check that box, all we're getting is 2%, but at least it's something, right? The question is, what will that do to our monthly benefit? And if we check that box, you can see it drops to $390. So it drops from just under 500 bucks to just under $400. So this 2% annual increase, which again, isn't keeping up with inflation. Uh, inflation's averaged 3% over the last, say, century. And as we know, it can be a lot higher than that. But even just a 2% annual increase would drop your monthly benefit by roughly 20%. It's a very, very um, significant uh, drop. And it sort of underscores just how expensive any sort of inflationary adjustment would be for an in income annuity. But the key takeaway to understand is with these income annuities, they are not adjusted for inflation, which is probably the single biggest reason an insurance company can offer a payout that at least in year one is roughly 5.8% uh, of, of your investment. Again, assuming someone is you know a, a male, uh, 65 years uh, of age. A very important assumption. If we were to buy an annuity when we're older, uh, the initial payout would be uh, would be higher. The second reason we can get 5.8% is it's a guarantee for life. And um, insurance companies, you know, have a large pool of annuitants and they recognize that some are going to live to be 100. Some are only going to live a couple more years, say, from 65. So they're basically uh, banking on the averages, right? And so we could die before our expected, you know, life. And in effect, the insurance company would sort of make out, if you will. They would, they, would, they would get the benefit of that. On the other hand, we could live much longer. Of course, at 65, most of us don't know how that's going to turn out. Uh, but we're sort of gambling, and the insurance company is sort of gambling, if you will. But because of that, because they're sort of pulling us with other annuitants and just taking the average, uh, they can offer us more, at least as, as a starting point, 
than we could on an inflation adjusted basis out of a portfolio using say the 4% rule. So those are really important aspects to, to understand when it comes to income annuities. Now, that all raises the question, well, should we annuitize some of our portfolio? Uh, when should we annuitize the portfolio, if at all? How much of our portfolio uh, should we use to buy an annuity? And there is no black and white answer to that, uh, but I'm gonna begin to sort of uh, try to answer that for you or with you today. And the starting point is to look at a formula. So let me go back to the screen. I am showing you here an article this comes from Morningstar. It was actually published just about a month ago. And uh, they actually walk through a formula that I want to look at in for just a few minutes. And here it is. It's right here. WR minus SWR divided by AR minus SWR. Now I know you're thinking, what in the world does all that mean? Don't worry, it's very simple. That formula actually comes from this book, Retirement Income Redesigned. It was edited. This book is actually a collection of articles from a number of different uh, financial planners. It was edited by, among others, you can see maybe Harold Avinsky. Uh, his name has come up in past uh, YouTube videos in, in this channel because he's sort of the father of the bucket strategy. In any event, he did not write the chapter uh, that gave us the formula we're going to look at. Again, here it is. And we're going to actually walk through that and look at an example. And I'm going to tell you what each of these, these letters, these acronyms mean. So to do that, we're going to the whiteboard. So again, uh, here's the formula, WR minus SWR divided by AR minus SWR. So what are these things? Well, withdrawal rate is just percentage, whoops, let me try that again. Here we go. The percentage we spend each year. So for example, if we have a million dollar portfolio, let's assume that in year one, we need to spend $44,000. This is actually a specific example in the Morningstar article. So we'll use that. Well, 44,000 divided by a million is 4.4%. So that would be our withdrawal rate. So let's just put that in 4.4. All right. Uh, now, SWR is safe withdrawal rate. So the idea here is how much can we take out of uh, an investment portfolio, then adjust it for inflation without the risk of running out of money? Now, here you might think, well, we've got the 4% rule. That's probably as good as anything else. And I wouldn't disagree with that now. But some might say, yeah, but I'm really worried about running out of money. Uh, bond yields are low. Stock valuations are high. I want to be conservative with this formula. So maybe we should drop that down, even for someone retiring at a traditional age. And that's actually what they did in the Morningstar article. They used 3.5%. Okay, fair enough. And in, in, in your case, you might want to try a number of different safe withdrawal rates just to see how that changes the formula. But we'll use that. And then what is this AR number? Well, this is the percentage you're going to get back from uh, uh, the annuity. So remember, we took a 65 year old male, we calculated what they would get on a monthly basis, multiplied it by 12 and then divided by the amount of the investment. Right now, in that case, it came out to 5.88%. We're going to actually change things a little bit just to follow the Morningstar example. They actually uh, priced an annuity for someone who was age 70, so five years older. And of course, someone who's 70, their life expectancy isn't as long as someone who's 65. And so the benefit they'll get is a little bit higher. And so when you take the benefit they will get, multiply it by 12 and then divide by uh, the amount of the investment, you actually get 6.7%. So that's what we'll put in here. And then we subtract the 3.5. Again, that's the safe withdrawal rate. Now, before we do the math, I want to point something out. When we think about the safe withdrawal rate, we always start with a percentage, in this case, three and a half, and then we adjust for inflation going forward, right? That's just comes from the standard 4% rule of William Bingen. And when we think about our withdrawal rate or spending rate in retirement, we tend to think about adjusting that for inflation as well as, you know, prices for if things go up, well, we're going to have to pay more. Now, some will say that over time in retirement, our spending actually goes down. Studies do uh, back that up. But at least for a period of time, our expenses are going to go up uh, during retirement just because of inflation. I point that out for this reason. The, the AR number, which is in this case 6.7, comes from the annuity, right? And the annuities are not indexed for inflation, as I pointed out. So I think that's something to think about. 
the numbers in this formula, we tend to think about adjusting them for inflation, and we do, but not in this case, uh, the annuity rate. 6.7 is not adjusted for inflation. So if we do the math, what we end up with is 28.1%. So under the formula, if we were just blindly following this, it would say if, if this is our circumstance, we think the safe withdrawal rate is three and a half, uh, we're gonna spend 4.4% of our portfolio in year one, we're 70, we've looked at the income annuities, we've done the math, uh, we're gonna get a 6.7% uh, uh, rate on the, the annuity, meaning uh, the amount we'll get uh, the first year divided by the amount we're going to invest is 6.7%. Uh, if we do the math, it comes out to 28.1%, and that's the percentage of our portfolio that we should annuitize. So if we had a $1 million portfolio, according to this formula, we should take $281,000 and buy an annuity. That'll leave us with, you know, what, 720000 roughly. And um, uh, we would keep that invested, and we could pull our, uh, our money from that just like we would normally. So is this a good formula or not? Well, I think it's a starting point. I think it's, it's interesting, but I have a couple of issues with it, and they underscore issues and things I think we should consider when we talk about and think about an income annuity. Let me, let me show you what I mean. First of all, uh, this top portion, notice what happens if it turns out to be negative. For example, let's imagine that our, um, our spending rate the first year, or they call it the withdrawal rate, is 3.9. And let's imagine we're comfortable with a 4.0 uh, safe withdrawal rate. Well, what's 3.9 minus 4.0? Well, it's a negative number. It's a negative, what, 0 0.1. Well, doesn't matter what's down here as long as it's positive we end up with a negative percentage right and that's actually okay under the formula uh going back to this book they actually talk about negative so yeah you, your formula might give a negative result and what does that mean no annuity at all and i'm not sure that's actually correct that just because this formula ends up with a negative number uh means we should never buy a, an annuity uh, and, and let me give you a, sort of a, a, an approach the way I think about it. And actually start with a fresh screen. Here we go. Let's imagine we'll use as a safe withdrawal rate 4.0. Uh, we can imagine three buckets in my, in my mind. We could say, all right, our spending rate is close to 4.0. Let's imagine it's somewhere between 3.0 and 5.0, right? That's one sort of group of retirees. And then we could imagine another group that's, say, less than 3.0. So maybe they're, I don't know, we'll say 2.5, right? So that means that they don't need to spend much of their portfolio in order to live the, the life in retirement that they want to live. And then we could also imagine another group of folks that, you know, need to spend more. Maybe they're at 5.5%. And that's significantly above, uh, let's say, what, what most would call a safe withdrawal rate. So why have I done this? Well, at the heart, an annuity is longevity insurance. It's, it's ensuring that you'll have some money, not if you die at 75, having retired at 65, that's not the concern. It's if you live to be 103, that's, that's the concern, right? But here's the deal. If you only need to spend 2.5% of your nest egg, based on Monte Carlo analysis or any historical data that we've ever experienced in the last 100 plus years, not only will you not run out of money, you will die at 103 with far more than you started with. The point is, if you've got a really low spending rate in year one, even adjusting it for inflation, the odds that you'll actually need longevity insurance, I think, are very, very low. That's point one. Now, what about the other end? Here's the other problem. If you have a spending rate that's too high, what does that effectively mean? It means you don't have enough to retire on. You either have to lower your spending if you can, or you need to work a few more years and increase your savings. But the fact is, if you're spending significantly more than a reasonable range of a safe withdrawal rate, however you want to calculate that, you don't have enough money to retire. And here's the key point. Annuities won't solve that problem, right? Buy an annuity won't magically convert someone who doesn't have enough to retire 
into someone who does. It's like you know, buying an annuity into those circumstances is like putting a Band-Aid on a broken arm. It, it, it ain't gonna help. So this is really important. An annuity won't solve the problem of not having enough money to retire. So that then brings me to this third group of people that's kind of somewhere in the middle, right? They, they, they're close to what one could reasonably argue is a, a safe withdrawal rate. Again, we're just using 4.0 as an example. You may think it's a little lower or a little higher than that. Uh, but here's the deal. I think this is actually the sweet spot for folks where an annuity might make sense. You're kind of on the bubble. You're close. Uh, maybe you're really nervous about how you're investing your money. You're really scared that you'll run out of money. And so annuitizing uh, some portion of your portfolio in this range, I think, may make sense. And that's true even if you're a bit below what you think is a safe withdrawal rate. I mean, we're kind of cutting the bacon thin, so to speak, if we decide that a 4% uh, withdrawal rate is safe and we're at 385 uh, under the formula, the answer would be easy. You just wouldn't buy an annuity. I think while the formula may be an interesting starting point, and you can certainly do the math for your own numbers very easily, I'm not convinced that just because you're below whatever we think might be a safe withdrawal rate, that you shouldn't buy an annuity. And so that gets me now to some resources that I want to show you. Again, I'll leave links to all of this below, but it's some different perspectives on income annuities. And I want to begin with an article from the Wall Street Journal. Here it is. And um, this article actually reaches out to some retirement experts, including Wade Fowl, who I've got a lot of respect for his work. And there were sort of two perspectives from this article on income annuities. Uh, Professor Fowl's approach was you should replace the bond portion uh, of your portfolio uh, with, um, with an, an income annuity. And so if you're whatever, say 70-30, you might take your 30% uh, uh, in fixed income portfolio and buy an annuity with it and then leave the rest um, uh, in, in stocks. And his point being that um, if, you, if, you tend, if you end up living longer than expected, which is again, what an annuity is protecting you against, you'll be better off with an annuity today than you would say a, a bond ladder. And they compared a portfolio, a $1 million portfolio that all was invested in bond, a bond ladder uh, versus buying an income annuity. And they concluded, yeah, if you live say past 85, so you lived in 90 or, or more, you'd be better off with an income annuity. I think it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. And I'm gonna, again, I'll link to the article. I think it's worth considering. I'm frankly, as much as I respect uh, Professor Fowle's views on retirement, I'm not convinced that that's the, the right way uh, to look at it. First of all, when you think about an income annuity, you're sort of locking in forever the low rate environment that we live in today. Remember, if rates were you know 5% higher, you would get a much bigger benefit, monthly benefit from an income annuity, but we're at historically low rates. And so by buying an income annuity today, you're locking in those low rates. I don't think that rules out an income annuity, but it would concern me to convert 100% of my bond portfolio to income annuities, keeping in mind that the alternative to an income annuity isn't necessarily buying and creating a bond, a bond a ladder, right? You could, in fact, you could just go with short-term bonds so that as interest rates rise, you get the benefit of those rising interest rates. But here's the other thing. A bond portion of your portfolio is used to rebalance. So when stocks fall, uh, you can take part of your fixed income portfolio and rebalance into stocks. If you've gotten rid of that bond portfolio and used, and used it to buy an income annuity, uh, you, you don't get that benefit of rebalancing. So I would be, I think, have a lot of hesitation to convert 100% of my fixed income uh, into bonds, uh, into, uh, into annuities. Now, one of the arguments in favor of that approach is to say, with that secured guaranteed income, I now am more comfortable taking risks and more risks with the remainder of my portfolio. And I think that's a legitimate consideration. One of the things I stress on this channel is, particularly with asset allocation, there are a lot of reasonable ways to go. One of the keys is whatever approach you take, can you stick with it? So if annuitizing some of your bond portfolio can help you stick with uh, an, an asset allocation that maybe takes on a little bit more risk, that may be worth considering. The second uh, approach mentioned in this article was 
take your essential expenses. So not everything you want to spend, not the trip around the world, not the home remodel, and not the expensive hobbies, but the essential expenses. You've got social security, most people do, maybe you have a pension, and then annuitize a part of your portfolio so that you can cover all of your essential expenses with guaranteed income. Again, I think it's worth considering. I don't think it's black and white. As I mentioned before, if you're only living on two, two and a half percent of your investments, frankly, you probably don't need an annuity even to cover essential expenses. But I do know that for a lot of people, being able to cover essential expenses would give them a lot of comfort. You just have to keep in mind that, as I've mentioned, the benefits are not indexed for inflation. So you may cover your essential expenses today, but will that income annuity still be covering your essential expenses 10 or 20 years from now? That's gonna depend on what your spending looks 10 or 20 years from now. Perhaps you're spending less, as studies say we often do in retirement, but you and I are not a study. So while most people may spend less, who knows, maybe you or I will end up spending more. So you gotta keep all of that in mind. All right, the next article I wanna mention is from the White Coat Investor. Uh, I actually was speaking with the founder of, of, of this uh, blog just the other day. And he's got a very good article on what he calls the good annuity, SPIAs, here we go. The one thing that I thought was interesting was a chart he put in here on calculating the return of a single premium immediate annuity. Uh, I don't know that returns, and he makes this point, returns on, annu on an annuity really aren't the purpose of it. It's really longevity insurance, but it, it's interesting to see what the returns are if you live until LE, your life expectancy, versus if you live five years past your life expectancy, versus if you, if you actually die five years before reaching your life expectancy. I thought this was interesting information, and so I, I thought I would include it. And again, I'll link to this below the video. The next source I wanna give you is the Rational Reminder podcast. One of the co-hosts of this is Ben Felix. He has an excellent YouTube channel, highly recommend it. I love the podcast. Episode 59, Financial Economics and Annuities, Rational Planning for Retirement. I thought this was a very good episode on annuities and I highly recommend it. They, they actually have a transcript here as well. I won't, it's a, it's a, a, a very detailed uh, episode, so I'll leave that for you if you'd like uh, to either read it or listen to it. I'm also gonna leave you uh, another uh, episode from Rational Reminder. This is from Gordon uh, Irlam. I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I will tell you this is a highly, highly technical episode. This is not for the faint of heart. He's developed something called the AI Planner, uh, which uses something called reinforcement learning to what he calls compute a near optimal spending and investment strategy. This is highly complex as well. One of the things you can model is how much of your portfolio should you annuitize? But again, it's just like the formula we looked at. This is based on his algorithms and they may or may not be right for you. So keep that in mind. I'll link to this along with an article that he wrote last year, Lifetime Portfolio Selection Using Machine Learning. Again, fair warning, these are highly dense uh, technical topics. Now, there is one benefit to uh, an income annuity and guaranteed income generally that I think gets missed. And it's this, we think about social security, for example, you get that check, uh, you count on that check, you know it's coming in each month. And so we tend to be more comfortable spending it all because we know next month we're gonna get another check and next year we're gonna get a cost of living adjustment even, so you've even got that. And so we're much more comfortable spending that money true, same is true with a pension, um, then we are spending out of investments. We get very nervous, and I can speak from experience, when we start spending investments, particularly if we have to go past income and dividends from our portfolio and actually sell shares. We get very nervous about that. And so what studies have found is that when you get retirement income from some guaranteed source, could be an annuity, could be a pension, social security, we tend to spend more even if the present value of all of those uh, guaranteed in sources of income are the same as a portfolio. We tend to spend the guaranteed income more than we do the portfolio. And in fact, yeah, they've got a study on it. It's right here. Uh, if you'd like to read it, you can. I'll leave a link to it, but I've kind of explained you know, the basics of this study. And uh, the point is, 
that a lot of times when we're just relying on our portfolio, we tend to underspend in retirement. That's actually as much a risk, maybe even more of a risk than spending too much for a lot of people. And so some can use uh, a, a income annuity, not to annuitize the whole portfolio, maybe not even to annuitize the entire bond portfolio, uh, but rather to annuitize some portion and uh, allow us to you know, have the freedom and the lack of, I'll call it angst, <laughs> from spending our, our retirement. And so again, you'd still have a portfolio to manage and it won't completely uh, uh, erase these issues, but I think it's part of the behavioral finance and um, uh, sort of psychological aspects of retirement that are very, very real. And I think it's worth considering as you think about what's best for you and your family. All right, uh, the final resource I wanna show you comes from uh, Michael Kitz's blog. And it's understanding longevity insurance. Again, I'll link to this article, but here's the deal. At the end of the day, an income annuity is designed uh, to insure us against living too long, right? If we knew at 65 that we were gonna die at 75, there would be no point in buying an annuity, but we don't know that, right? Well, buying an annuity at 65 is not the only way to insure against longevity. And there are at least well, there are many ways, but at least two come to mind. One is, we could buy an income annuity, but not when we're 65. Maybe we wait until we're 70, 75, or even 80. Now, there are pros and cons to doing that. One of the big advantages is your benefit's gonna be a lot higher because you're older, right? A potential downside, however, is that you've gotta manage your portfolio until then, and depending on how the stock and bond market treat you uh, and how you handle that, uh, you could end up with a lot less money to buy the annuity um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years later. I will tell you, though, uh, that a lot of experts say the ideal time to buy an income annuity is not 65, but somewhere between 70 and 80. So that's one approach. The other approach, though, uh, is Michael Kitsis details that in this article, is eff eff effectively a deferred income annuity. So the idea is you might buy the annuity at 65, but it's designed to start paying you uh, benefits, say, 20 years later when you're 85. For example. Now, what would be the advantage of doing that? Well, the big advantage is the cost at 65 is much, much lower uh, for obvious reasons, and that overcomes a significant issue that folks have with income annuities. Spending all this money when you're, say, 65 and losing control of that. You know, if you've got a million dollar portfolio and you're going to spend 300000 on the on an annuity, you've lost control of that money. You've reduced your portfolio by, you know, 30% and you've lost control of that money. And that makes a lot of folks, frankly, myself included, a little uncomfortable. And so with a deferred annuity, you spend a lot less, and yet you're still insuring against the real concern, and that is that you live uh, uh, longer than your money can support you. So again, I'll leave a link uh, to that article below the video. Now, to close this out, I wanna talk about one last issue, and this is, applies to annuities generally, but also to income annuities. And that is the fear factor. A lot of annuities are sold based on fear. And the annuity salesperson will say, you know, what, do, what would you do if we had another tech bubble burst and another great recession? And how would you live through that? Let me show you an example of that. Uh, this is a, a site that I'm, I'm not familiar with. It's called the Annuity Guys. I have no opinion about their site or them. But uh, they talk about this. They say goodbye to the 4% rule. I personally disagree with that. But they cite a study from T. Rowe Price that said, look, if you retired on January 1, 2000 with an initial 4% withdrawal rate, you had 55% stocks, 45% bonds, uh, and you rebalanced each month, and uh, you, you know, increased the withdrawals by a 3% rate of inflation, at the end of 2010, uh, you would have basically uh, lost a third of your portfolio. That, that's the story. Now, I don't necessarily challenge the facts. I'm sure T. Rowe Price got the numbers correct, although we're going to look at them. But here's the interesting thing to me. This is published, according to this date anyway, in November of 2020. And so I'm curious why they're citing a study that ended in 2010. We've got another decade of data. Why not use it, right? The other thing that was interesting to me is why are they assuming a 3% inflation rate. We actually know what the inflation rate was during those times. So why in the world would T. Rowe Price not just use, well, here we go, the actual inflation rate, which some years was higher, but many, many years was lower. <laughs> One year was actually negative. 
And so what I did was I thought, well, let's back test this. So I went to our good friend Portfolio Visualizer, put in a million bucks from 2000 to 2009. That's a, the, the, the dead decade, right? That was the awful decade. We're going to take out 40,000 a year adjusted for inflation. I could rebalance monthly. I'm not sure why anyone would. I guess we'll do that. Maybe that'll give us a different result since that's what T. Rowe Price did. I've got their portfolio in here, 55% stocks, 45%. I used intermediate term treasuries. We analyzed the portfolio. Well, it didn't go down by a third. Maybe that's because we're using the actual uh, inflation rate. I'm not sure. But hey, in fairness, it went down. But let's think about this. If you retired at 65, you're now 75. You've received $40,000 adjusted for inflation for 10 years. So we're talking probably almost a half a million bucks. And you still have $832,000 left. To me, that doesn't seem like a bad outcome at all. Uh, but what happens, by the way, if we say, well, you know, we've got this data. Why not go to 2021? What's it look like then? Analyze that portfolio. Look, now we've taken out 20 years of inflation adjusted spending beginning at $40,000 and our balance has gone up. We're now at 1.3 million. Think about that. Tired at 65. Now we're 85. We haven't annuitized any portion of our portfolio and we've got over 1.3 million bucks more than we started with. Here's my point. Um, don't let uh, fear drive your decision, at least without an objective look at the numbers. I'm not pretending that in retirement our emotions aren't important. I know the fear of spending uh, you, you know, money out of your portfolio. I get it. It's real and we need to deal with it. But I think as an initial matter, we should at least have all of the facts available to us at our disposal and to use them. Don't let fear drive the decision. And if you want to get professional help with this decision, and I highly recommend it, and I am not a professional investment advisor or certified financial planner, then I think you need to find someone who you can play a, pay a flat fee to, who importantly, will not be selling you the annuity. Get their advice on what you should do. Uh, and I think that would help you substantially. Hopefully all of the resources that we've gone through will help you as well. As I said, you'll find links to everything below the video. All right, I know I've thrown a lot at you today. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to help you out. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.